human before an angel. Which Jesus do you worship? Who and what are you? Remember these classic two light and two states? Well, they're back. Brought to you by the Holy Tabernacle Ministry. In the 70s on up through the 80s, he took us through class one, Islam. Then class two, Christianity. On up through class three, which was the total truth. The religion of Abraham for his chosen people, the new people. As time progressed, we progressed. And now it is time to learn and keep the real and complete facts. The laws of Uwapu, known as right now, sound right reason, as brought to the planet Earth by the Elohim. Listen to the soul-stirring voice of the greatest teacher of this day and time as he answers all questions put forth. We don't have time to waste with false teachers and leaders who don't know where to lead us. The information on these tapes may appear to be different to you than what is being taught now, but it's not. The information is as right and exact today as it was then. If you are a child of the star, then this information is for you. If you're not, then it's not. For all of you who want to hear the many schools we have been through, or if you want to remember the nourishing history and growth of right now, come follow the land. He has the whole truth. Listen to his tape on your truth, your salvation. For more information on HTM products, tapes, and book listings, contact the Holy Tabernacle Ministry, Post Office Box 4490, Eastington, Georgia, 31024. In St. Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if any man comes to me and hate not his father and mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and his sister, ye in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Um, I want to know what did Jesus mean by this? First of all, the most important point is that if people realize that Jesus made that kind of statement. Because that's the problem. A lot of Christians don't even imagine the Jesus that they speak of as having made a statement like this. You got to give up your mother, your father, your sisters, your brothers, and everybody, and devote your life to him. I'm not talking about me, because that's what a lot of people would like to make people think I'm saying. I'm talking about Jesus the Messiah, who is telling people that they will have to turn away from their family. What makes this so obscure if he indeed did this himself? Didn't Jesus turn away from Mary when he came out from healing the man and some, some of his disciples said, Behold thy mother and thy brethren and pointed to Mary and James and them as they walked by and Jesus turned and said, My mother and my brethren are those who believe as I believe? This is his own statement. What Jesus was telling people is, Your family are the righteous. If your blood relatives stay in darkness, stay in Satan worship, stay living under evil, then they are no longer your family. Your family are those who believe that the only real father we have is our heavenly father. And that becomes one family of children who are called the sons and daughters of the heavenly father. That's what the angels were called, that's what Jesus was called, and as many as believe on him, what did he say? He gives them the power to become the what? The sons of God, right? So if you become a son of God, then that is your new family. Your family is a new family of the righteous, the saints, as they call them, or the holy ones in the books of Revelation. So what Jesus was really telling people is, in order for you to devote yourself to him, you'll have to cut away all family ties. Because your family will intercede, will interject their opinion, and try to pull you off the path of righteousness. And that's what happens many times. A man father had previously died when he came to Jesus and he asked Jesus what should I do about the burial of my father and Jesus answer was let the dead bury the dead that was his answer another man was out fishing for a livelihood and Jesus came to him and told him to put down his net and come follow him drop your net stop working to support your family drop your net and become a fisher of men and spend your time going out trying to convert people that's how Jesus taught Christians try to pretend that's not in the Bible because they're ignorant. They don't read the scriptures in any other language but what the white preacher gave their black pastor. 
whatever he passed on to your pastor is what your pastor is passing on to you without any in-depth understanding of the reality. When you call people together for righteousness, sometimes there's a lot of pain and suffering in it. When the righteous are gathered together, a lot of people are left behind because of their unrighteousness. And they might be the very people that you love. Don't forget that Jesus loved Judas. He said it. He said, one of those who are dear to me is going to betray me. Ain't that what he said? Yeah. He loved Judas, but Judas was acting the part of the devil. But he was still one of Jesus' relatives, and so far he was from the tribe of Judah. He was an Israelite, but he delivered Jesus into the hands of the enemy so that he could be destroyed. That's what he tried to do. And Jesus says in the Bible, in Matthew 24, that they're going to deliver you up. They're going to persecute you and deliver you into the hands of the enemy. And while they're doing it, they're going to think they're doing God a service when black people turn against black people and spy on black organizations and infiltrate black uh, organizations, call us cults because the white man says so. You understand what I'm saying? Turns us into the white man thinking they're doing the right thing because the God that they chose is the God bow. Not the law. They chose to worship the white man and live in his image like Jesus said. So when they give you into the white man's hands, they think they're doing their God of justice. So Jesus was saying that you may have to turn away from the people you love the most on earth in order for you to be with the people in heaven. You follow? I mean, it's good that you found a quote like that because people don't even look at things like that. You know, they look for everything they like to hear. And he gave his only begotten son that ever believed on him shall have that life. They find all the ones they like, and they never find those ones that are hard to deal with. You know what I'm saying? When Jesus said in St. John that they're going to put you out of the synagogue. They're going to put you out of the synagogue means that none of his followers are going to be in churches. His followers are going to be in synagogues, which means his followers are going to be what they call today Jews, not Christians. Christians go to churches. Jews go to synagogues. Jesus says in St. John chapter 16 verse 1, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. So his followers were not Christians. Christians don't want to hear that because they made a new religion up around Paul and another man named Bar Jesus who they think they're worshiping the real Jesus and they're worshiping a sorcerer named Bar Jesus who was also an Israelite, who also performed miracles and was classified as a false prophet in your Bible tonight. You understand what I'm saying? It's good that you're that observant or perceptive that you look for quotes like that. Okay, um, I have another quote too. And on St. Matthew, chapter 10, verse 34. <clears throat> Think not that I, that I am come to send peace on earth. I'm come not to send peace, but a sword. Um, I was going to ask... Um, Simple question. Jesus said, blessed are the what? And he also said another one. That's one of them. Blessed are the persecuted after righteous namesake. Right? Mm -hmm. So Jesus was telling his followers, by following me, you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be hurt, spat on. You're going to be attacked by Romans, then Edrin. You're going to be attacked by the Pharisees, the centurions, different people of the tribes of Israel, different people of Rome, and when you get to Greece, they're going to persecute you. That's what Jesus speaks about in Revelation. For those saints who were persecuted for my name's sake, killed for my name's sake, who gave, that's what they're speaking about. He's telling us that don't think that because I came that it's all going to be all roses, because see, the Israelites were under the impression that when Jesus the Messiah comes, you see, that he was going to bring peace to the world, they were going to conquer the Romans, and it would be all over, and they would rule forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> and Jesus said, don't think that that's what it's about. Well, now that I'm here, you're really going to get abused. You're really going to be harassed. You're really going to be attacked and spat on and scorned. And people are going to call you a fool and call you brainwashed and say you belong to a sect. People call us crazy and they want to spit on us. And they want to say we're brainwashed and we don't know what we're talking about. And we have people out there who want to attack us and kill us and get rid of us. This is what Jesus said. Because of his name's sake, because we acknowledge him as the Messiah of the world, that we will be persecuted for it. So don't think that I came and y'all are going to have all these roses. No. When you accept what I'm teaching, that's when the stuff is going to hit the fan. Because as long as you have the mark of the beast and live under the rule of the devil and accept his laws, you don't have any problem. The moment you go against his laws 
and start acknowledging who you are and say, I'm a Nubian and I'm a this and I recognize Jesus as the Messiah, not as God himself. And I recognize Muhammad as the seal of the prophets, the comfort of Jesus said would come after him. When you start doing that, the devil said, persecute that person for righteous name's sake only. Just because you're right. What is that? For righteous name's sake? You know what they mean? Only reason why they're picking on you is because you're righteous. That's the sole purpose. Because if I was a Negro running around the street drinking or smoking crack, they don't even bother to persecute them. Because you live in neighborhoods where you see crack houses and you say, why don't the cops just run in there and just close the place down? They don't do it. They don't persecute them. What they tell you is, we don't want the crack users. We want the pushers. If you arrest all the crack users, the pushers will come out. Because that's who's supporting them. Yeah, if you keep on trying to go through the crack music, if you think by arresting a crack music, he's going to tell you the bushes where he decides he got to get back to his crack, you're fooling yourself. So they don't want them. They persecute you for one reason and one reason only. They persecute you for righteousness. And I'll give you a perfect example of persecution for righteousness man's sake. Dr. Martin Luther King had a righteous heart. He meant well in everything he was doing, correct? We can't deny that. We may not agree with his doctrine and everything he taught, but he had a, a good heart and he meant well. What did they do then? And now Malcolm X, on the other hand, was totally against everything they was about, spoke bluntly against them, but in what, in what he believed, he also was sincere and had a good heart. What did they do to him? So now, what's the reason for him killing? Because you're black? No. He'll kill you for righteous name's sake. Just because you have submitted to the will of Allah or because you have become righteous and by submitting to Jesus or Yahweh or even Jah. He'll kill a Rasta, he'll kill anybody just because of righteous namesake. You understand that? He just does not want to see you and I serving anything other than him. And Revelation 13 tells you that. He wants us to serve him. And most of us, believe it or not, are serving him in one way or the other. By trying to look like him, by emulating him, which you understand, and that is his greatest desire, that we will turn away from ourselves and idolize him, worship him, and get the mark of prostrating to him on our head, the mark of the beast, instead of the mark of righteousness. I'm reading from St. Matthew 16, verse 24, 25. Then, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. I would like you to explain that to me because I don't understand. So it's a very good quote because the Christian's implication is that the cross in itself symbolizes Jesus died on. Right? Yes. If Jesus made that statement to me that what happened to him should happen to every one of his followers, then every one of his disciples and followers should be dead. They should all be crucified. No, what Jesus said, he was the one who was willing to suffer his life on the cross for another's sin. He was willing to die. You understand that? Even though when he got in the garden, he got scared in the last part of his life, he said, oh, my father, it could be possible to let this cup pass by me. Not of my will, but that thy will be done. He did get scared one time as a human being because he said, oh, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. This really is what Jesus is telling people by that quote is that follow him and you're going to have to bear cross like he did. That's the whole thing. There's suffering in following Jesus. Not a good time. There's suffering in righteousness. Not a good time. People are looking for a picnic in righteousness. There's not a picnic in righteousness. There's suffering. Jesus was, but all the miracles and great signs and wonders that he performed, what did they do to him? They still persecuted him. They still started him. They ignored his miracles. They ignored his good deeds and looked for the bad in him. They actually came out with the intent to psych him or trick him. You follow what I'm saying? So Jesus is telling you, after me, there'll be no, don't follow no false prophets because many false prophets will come and will mislead many people. Then he goes on in first John, when you see that spirit, test that spirit to see whether it is of God or not. For many false prophets have gone into the world. So he also confesses that after him, another prophet would come. But test the prophet to make sure he's not one of the false prophets. Who is the prophet that Jesus was talking about? Was the same one that when the Pharisees came and asked John the Baptist, are you Elijah? And he said no, because he didn't know until Jesus told him he was. They asked him, are you the Messiah? He said no, he wasn't Jesus. Well, are you that prophet? But it was expecting three things. They was expecting the return of Elijah, 
then the Messiah, and then a prophet. John the Baptist later on found out that he indeed was the return of Elijah because Jesus said so. And Jesus indeed was the Messiah. So we covered two of those personalities John the Baptist was questioning about. But the third personality, are you that prophet, they never addressed. Jesus spoke in St. John chapter 15 as well as in chapter 16 that another comforter, another comforter. When you say another comforter, that means like something that is already here will come unto you. Yes, he will be endowed with the Holy Spirit. Wasn't Jesus still the Holy Spirit? Yes. So to be endowed with the Holy Spirit, to be of the Holy Spirit does not mean that you are indeed the Holy Spirit. Jesus was a prophet. He said himself, a prophet is without honor in his own house. So Jesus said he is a prophet. Yet, as a prophet, he was still classified as one endowed with the Holy Spirit. But he blew the Holy Spirit on his own disciples. He sent them out, teaching in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So he gave the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had the power to give men a Holy Spirit. And when they had the Holy Spirit, then they were endowed. And thus would be the Holy Spirit. The point I'm trying to make is that so after Jesus, he predicted the coming of another prophet, and this prophet would be a human being who would be full of the Holy Spirit, which was none other than the Ahmed, which is another word for comfort or praise, which is Muhammad. So when Jesus told people to pick up that cross and follow him, what he was telling them is that when you become one of my followers, life is going to be tough. Because they're going to want to persecute you for righteous name sake. They're not going to just accept you. They're going to abuse you. They're going to spit on you. That's what they do to righteous people. They don't bother the seven-day adventures. They don't bother the Jehovah's Witnesses, do they? By that I mean, they don't come on the news and say, the other night, some, uh, some man beat his daughter to death. Right? Mm -hmm. They didn't come on and say, he was a Jew. A Jew beats his daughter to death or when the black boys who got killed in Howard Beach, they didn't say some Catholic from Howard Beach killed some Baptist from Brooklyn or the Bronx. They don't do it. But if a Muslim does something to do, right away it's black Muslim does so-and-so, right? Mm -hmm. We're persecuted for righteous they say. If a brother who's a Rastafarian does something to do, Rastafarians pick up banks. Banks are being stuck up 24 hours a day. Is this not true? People are being raped every day. Women are being murdered every day. They never bring up what church they belong to, what congregation, and what reverend. They don't ever say, and one of Jerry Falwell's followers in New York just shot the little kid up. No, but if one of Farrakhan's followers do something, they say a black Muslim follower of Minister Louis Farrakhan just slaps a little kid in the head <laughs> and, and throws a book at them and tries to give them life, double standards. So just the word peacemaker, which Jesus gave us when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, which is another way of saying Muslims, one who's a peace, the word peace is salam, like Jerusalem, and Jesus says a peacemaker, he means a Muslim, that very word immediately makes them want to persecute you. Let me tell you something, not only will they persecute you, they'll lie on you. They'll fabricate lies, they'll imprison you and create cases around you. The same way they tried to defame the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and then they tried to defame Malcolm X, and then they even, they even tried to defame Dr. Martin Luther King by some secretary. That's what they'll do. They'll imprison you, and then they'll create lies to turn your own people against you. They'll persecute you after righteous name's sake. The same way I'm talking to you, they're going to come after me eventually. Believe me. They're going to say, that man is too dangerous. I don't like him. Let's make some lies up on him. Let's turn his people against him. Let's imprison him. And if we can, let's kill him because his people won't help him anyway. And they'll try it. And I'll be at the mercy of the devil. Because people say, well, won't Allah step in and help you? And I say, did he step in and help John the Baptist? And the answer would be no. <laughs> he will not intervene at that point. You understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have another question. I'm reading from St. Matthew 18, 3 to 4. And it says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Can you explain that to me, please? Simple. Now, it tells you it's 18, right? Yeah. Of Matthew. Read what Riva 1 says. At the same time, 
came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, What? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest in the kingdom? You know why? In the book of Revelation, they have a problem about who's the greatest, you know. People don't realize it. Because at one point it speaks about the Lamb. And he walks into the throne and takes the scroll out of somebody's hand who's sitting on the throne. And that person sitting on the throne gives praise to the Heavenly Father who's the Creator. So now we have the Heavenly Father who's the Creator, somebody sitting on the throne, 24 elders with thrones, four beasts, Jesus the Lamb, certain angels of strength, certain angels of power. So there's a power struggle about who is great in the kingdom of heaven. We know Allah who asked about us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most magnificent. And Jesus eventually says that at the end of Revelation. But they were disputing about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Then he says what? And Jesus called a little child unto him. And set him in the midst of them. Stood the little boy right in the middle of the crowd of disciples he's talking to and said, What? Let me ask him to you. Except you be converted and become as little children. That's the point one. Children. First point is, see this little boy here? You see how innocent he is? He's not a clouded with opinions and thoughts and ideas and desires and wishes and wants and poisons and prisons and murders and fornication and whoredom and lies. This little kid is still pure. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, in order for you to get into this kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to go back and act like a child. You're going to have to shut up again. You're going to have to relearn your language, relearn your customs, relearn your lifestyle. You're going to have to shed yourself like a snake of the bad skin that you picked up from the serpent who ruled the world. You're going to have to peel that skin off of the white man, peel that skin off of the devil, and put on the garb of righteousness and be like a baby born again. You have to start all over again and forget your ideas and what you think and what you want to be. This is what Jesus offers us. Most of us don't do that. Most preachers become Christians with their own minds, with their own ideas, with their own thoughts and principles. When Jesus said, all you got to do is open your mouth and the Spirit will speak through you. But most preachers don't do that, you know. They come in with their concept. Jesus is saying, see this little boy or this little child? <laughs> if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to be converted and become a little child. Or come as little children, but you put it in plural. If not, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You follow that? You can get into the kingdom on earth, but you will not get into the, when the crystal city comes down out of heaven. You won't be entitled to that, which is Revelation 22, the last revelation. Now, at 21. Now, read on. 18.4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Those of you who are willing to drop everything you think you're about and humble yourself like a baby, what will you be? The same is greatest. You'll be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Go on. And whosoever shall receive one such, such little child, and my name receiveth me. And anyone who gives birth, you understand? After righteousness mm -hmm. to a little child, they are given birth to a child just like me. In other words, that mother will be like Mary, and she will give birth to a supernatural child. That'll be the 144,000. Those who are not defiled by the harlot. Those who are, who, who are still virgins, it's only when you people stop doing what you're doing, and then you purify yourself, you will give birth to children who are just like Christ. You understand? They will be messiahs. Go ahead. Number six? Yes. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, if it were better for him that a, a millstone mill were hanged about his neck, and that he would drown in the death of the sea. But anyone who tries to hurt the Holy One, the saints, the book of Revelation call them, will be called in the last day. The children, your children, if you'll take the time now to give birth to them and raise them in righteousness, anyone who tries to hurt them, it would be as if he is carrying a stone on his neck, a millstone. Now, does that, that means that the Lord of the Lord is telling us that we can be hurt, you and I, the devil will smash me and you at any given moment. But he will put a, a hamper. He will put a protection over them, over the children, a talisman. So when the devil gets ready to come down on them, they will have a shield. You understand? Yes. Against the devil. Not you. The devil will walk up and slap you upside the head. He believe it. But he can't do it to the kids if you raise them in righteousness. But if you give them unto him, he'll destroy them. Mm -hmm. Whoa unto the world 
because of offenses, for it must need to be that offensive offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. It says, it, it, it's saying a plague. Woe is a plague. Wait a minute. Is a plague is upon the world because he's so offended. You understand? And this world is receiving the plagues of Allah because it refuses to bow itself before the Heavenly Father like a baby. So we're bringing our own condemnation on ourselves, our own plague, our own destruction upon ourselves. You understand? Answer the question. Yes. It's the last question I have. I would like to know where do you get the name Allah from? And then churches, they use the name Jehovah. Okay. And that is a very good point. Other than the fact that, don't assume that the churches are correct because they make mistakes. The word Jehovah comes from four Hebrew word letters. Yad, He, Wav, and He. Yad is a brother to be writing on the blackboard. The smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Yad. That is equivalent to the English letter Y. Okay? The second is H, and it's equivalent to the English letter H. The next one is Wav, which is equivalent to the English letter W. And the father is a duplicate of the second, which is H, which is a symbol of the English letter H. When you look at it, you see Yahweh. Right? Now, that's without the vowel. If I write Yahweh and then add an A after the Yah, I get Yah. And then I put an O after the first A, I get Ho. And then I get Wah again. Yahweh. Okay? Mm -hmm. When the language was taken from the Hebrew and put into the Greek and the Latin, they changed the Y from Y to J. This is an alteration of the name of the Most High, even though Jesus Christ, as they call him, said, Our Father who art in heaven, what's the next line? Holy is your name. Say it again. Holy is thy name. He said, Holy is thy name. Holy is something not mixed, diluted, or tampered with in any way. If they alter or dilute or tamper with the name, then it's no longer holy. Right here, when they take the Y from the ancient Hebrew and replace it with a J, they have tampered with the name. Phonetically. You understand what I'm saying? Tone wise. And if in the scriptures they speak about people chanting and singing the name of the Most High, then you have to keep the tone because the tones are necessary. So when we say Jehovah, we're saying, and, oh, and let me move on. Later on, when the Germans got a hold of it, they removed the W and replaced it with a V. But they didn't have a W in the German language. They put the V in there. And it became known as Jehovah. A distorted way of saying Yahweh. Now Yahweh is nothing but the Hebrew for the word Yah, which means O and Hua. The pronoun He. Yahweh means O He who is who He is. Yahweh. O He. You follow that? Now, where does the word Allah come from? So all the scriptures say, St. John chapter 1 says, He put His Spirit into man. Right? The same spirit, as they put it, the same spirit which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In Genesis, he said, he blew into man of his spirit, and man became a living soul. The question is, they have this constant statement of in, be, in. He put into man. So therefore, the spirit of the Most High was outside of the shell of Adam when Adam was created of the dust of the ground. All right? Mm -hmm. So he created the body first, then he blew into man of his spirit. So the spirit was outside because it moved upon the surface of the waters, and then it was placed in the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul, correct? Mm -hmm. So the way that you would know the created name is because it would be something that enters inward before it goes out. Because it couldn't be out inside and go out, it must be outside and come into us, alright? Now I want you to say God. God. Say it loud. God. Try to breathe in while you're saying it. God. You can't, right? You have to either breathe in first or after. Say Jehovah. Jehovah. Try to breathe in and say it. Jehovah. You can't. Say Jah. Jah. Try to breathe in. Say O. O. Say Buddha. Buddha. Say Zoroastrian. <laughs> you can't breathe in and say none of these names. Say Bow. Bow. Balance. Balance. Satan. 
faces. Now say Allah. Allah. You see? <laughs> Wasn't it true? That's the only thing that you said that you breathe in first. And it has two parts to it. It's Allah. The Al is in and the Allah is out. The name Allah is the breath of life. The root of the word Allah is al Allah, and the last letter is from the word Hawa, which means to express oneself totally emotionally and compassionately. Allah is the breath of life and the compassion that that Creator had when He thought of our creation and put Himself in us in order to make us living souls. Go ahead. They say that when babies cry, that they say Allah. Exactly, they can't say, you heard a baby saying that one, Jehovah, Jehovah. This is a short quote to remind you that these are old classics of Dr. Malachi Z. York, then known as Alman Isa al Hadi al Nasi, teaching one of the schools on our way up onto the water. So what? God, God, God. I can guide myself to death if I don't turn around and say Allah somewhere in there. I don't go, I can go, God, God, God. Then someone else will go, if a man falls off a cliff, no man falls off a cliff going, God, boom. Or Jehovah, boom. Or Jah, boom. You don't go, ah, right? If a person runs up to you and scares you in the alley, what do you say? God. No. <laughs> Jehovah, no, you go, ah. <laughs> the first thing you do is you go back to the name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You go, ah. And then your heart goes, ah, ah. You say, man, you almost scared me to death. So at the point of death, what name comes to you first? Allah, ah. Now, go to your Bible, somebody that you'll know the quote. It ain't even that I didn't take you to Psalms to be easy. Go to Psalms uh, 22. You want me to read it? Oh, what I really need is the first couple of lines, because the first couple of lines is all what I'm talking about. Where it says, my God, my God. My God, my God, what? Why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Christians have taught you that that was Jesus' statement while on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Now I take you to Matthew 27, verse 46. Go to Matthew 27, 46. And I want you to see, because that wasn't Jesus that time, that was a uh, David, because they also crucified David. A lot of Christians don't know that. 27, 46? Yes. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabat kani. That's right. So that's right. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what I always ask those witnesses? Excuse me? You know what I like to ask those witnesses? No. Why didn't Jesus say, Jehovah, Jehovah, why have thou forsaken me? He's here at the point, according to them, of death. He's at this point where he's getting ready to give up his holy ghost. He is getting ready to die right here. You understand? According to that teaching now. Mm -hmm. Yet, he calls Allah. Eli is nothing but Allah. It's not nowhere. It's, what does it sound closer to? Eli. Does it sound closer to Allah or Jehovah? Jesus said himself, while on the cross, according to them, According to them, he says, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. And then they interpret Eli as my God. My as God. my God. Jesus is God with Eli. So if the Jehovah Witnesses want to make Jehovah their God, that's their business. We're not interested in who they make their God. We're interested in who Jesus made his God. Jesus called his God Allah. That's who we're following. They can follow anybody they feel like following. But they will never show me in the Bible when he said, Jehovah, Jehovah, why have thou forsaken me? Mm. Ask them that one. Thank you. A pleasure. Can I ask another one? That's what I'm here for. <laughs> uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. Go ahead, I'm with you. Uh, this is after which which was explained to me last week to where John, he went into, uh, the door was open and he went into the ship with the elders, I believe. No, they, they misinformed you if they did last week. Excuse me? I, they misinformed you if they did last week. Listen to it, from one. 
It's always good to start the revelation for one. Okay. To begin reading. Yeah. Okay. After this, I look and I'm gonna break into little pieces if you don't mind. That's so we we'll understand. That's fine. All right. <laughs> after this, the main point is after this, mm -hmm. which means he. This is a continuating thought from an event that took place in Revelation 3. Right. When he finally finishes talking about who the seven churches are that this book of Revelation was to be given to. So they told John to put these book of Revelation into book form and to give it to the churches. The Christians don't want to see that, you know. They want to see if this book belongs to them. And it says in the book, put this in book form and do what with it? And give it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. So the book of Revelation was not written for you. It was written for the seven churches. So these beasts, these creatures, would know who the righteous are and the unrighteous and the kingdom of the heavens and earth. That's what it was for. Now he goes on and says, now after I came to the realization of the seven churches, which are the seven major religions that rule the world, and this revelation was to be given to them so that they would all repent. He says, after this, I looked, then I looked, and I saw, or behold, a door, not the door, a door was open in heaven. He was able to look up and look into heaven. He didn't walk into it. Right? Mm -hmm. And the first voice, now what is the, see the point is people got to understand, why did he say the first voice here? Because, because there, was, there was going to be some to follow. That's right. And the first voice he heard was who? Somebody who sat on the throne. This is not Jesus. Mm -hmm. The first voice was the first angel that spoke to him. In Revelation, right here in Revelation chapter 1, go to it, let's find out the first voice. It says the revelation of Jesus the Messiah, which Allah gave unto him to show unto his servants things, meaning Allah's servants, not Jesus' servants, things which must shortly come to pass, things going to happen soon. Mm -hmm. And he sent it and signified it by his angel. So now the first voice is the voice of this angel. And that's the angel Michael, who also throughout this book of Revelation as a defender, because he was the one that was in heaven in Revelation chapter 12, who defeated he did Satan and cast him down to earth, correct? Right. So now let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and follow up. So now what does John say? After this, after I learned about the seven religions of the world, after this I looked and behold, there was a door open in heaven. And the first voice, which was Melchizedek's voice, the angel Michael, not Jesus like the Christians try to make it sound, yeah. which said, first voice, which said, come up hither, I will show these things which must be here. Now remember, he was already transformed into the physical status in Revelation. Now they're taking him higher to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. There are planes in the heavens. There's Nassau, there's Malakut, and there's Lahu. There's dimensions in the heavens. They're telling him, now go higher, vibrate faster, come up closer to the kingdom of heaven before the throne, the crystal city. And what? And immediately I was in the spirit. I was transformed out of my body in a spiritual state, John said. This is a spiritual observation. And what did he see? Because of the future. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. There was, there was a seat in heaven. <clears throat> and one sat on the throne. And somebody was sitting on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine. The word jasper mm -hmm. is a transparent crystal stone. Right. He was looking, he said, this being I'm looking at was something like gold. He was ectoplasma. He was etheric. He was transparent. Yet he was sardine, which is sardine, which is brownish red. Right. So he looked at a man sitting there who was transparent, yet the man, according to the scriptures, was sardine. Mm -hmm. Most Christians say that's Christ because they don't read them. They don't read other languages, that's the biggest problem, because when you got to do this in English, it's sad. When I translate it, I translate it from the original language, and it's much clearer. But instead of saying Sardius, they say, who is reddish brown in complexion. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. That was what my question was right there, because I looked those two uh, terms. Let's go on so we can confirm things, though. Okay. Because Melchizedek in the Arabic language is called El Khidr. Mm -hmm. The word Khidr is the word Ahzab, which means green. Okay, you hear the same sound? The, the color green in Arabic is Ahzab. The, the word for Melchizedek in Arabic is El Qidr, the green one. So watch what happens in the next verse. All right. Jesus is not known to have a green aura. It goes on to say, And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. See, there was, with this throne that he looked up at, he noticed that it was a green aura around, a halo, a rainbow of green. This was Melchizedek. 
and you go on and read this close, it will tell you this is not David. Why? Because this angel was this angel in Revelation chapter one that they're talking about, people thought was Jesus Christ. They think that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which Allah gave unto him to show unto his servants, Allah's servants, things which must come to pass shortly, or will happen soon. And he sent it, right? Mm -hmm. And signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So an angel brought the revelation to John. And that same angel is going to talk in the first person throughout the scripture of Revelation. Come here, John. Come here, John. And I, John, was with him. And I saw him do this. And, I, and then he's going to separate that angel on the throne from the Lamb. They're going to make a distinction in five and six of that Lamb and that the beast, the Lamb, and the man sitting on the throne. All the Christian evangelists and translators of Revelation get stuck because they start off first by telling people that the person sitting on the throne in heaven is Jesus. Then they say, no, it's God. And then when he gets down to 10, he says, the Lamb, he who sits on the throne, the Lamb, and worships God day and night. So they separate God, but they're stuck again. So they're not supposed to understand the book of Revelation. It says that. Okay? Mm -hmm. One last one here. Uh, chapter 22, verse 20. And it goes, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. What is that after the amen? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is John saying the same thing a Christian or, or a righteous person would say. Hallelujah, Jesus come. This is, this is an addition. Mm -hmm. The thought of Revelation ends when he says, right? Uh -huh. He which testifies these things said, surely I come quickly. So John said, Jesus who made the testimony of these things said, I will be coming soon. Now remember this book was revealed in the year 96. This is way after so-called Christian prayer of time. So Jesus, he's talking about, Jesus talking about his second coming, not his first. And the word of John say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, which is Rabbi Jesus or Master Jesus. He said, well, whatever, hurry up, we need you. This is what he was saying. Then what he had on that? Mm -hmm. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That tells you that it's not Jesus' revelation at this point. This person is saying, let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. John is signing the book himself. But he says not, let my grace as Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's let the, the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. When he says that, our Lord, he's telling you that he's adding this signature to this hymn. He's saying, let Jesus Christ's grace be upon you. Because grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Though the law came from Moses. The law we should live came out of the books of Moses, Leviticus, and Exodus. But the truth and grace came through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior to the world, who came to his own, but his own received him not. Thank you. That's all for now. I was taught in church that when Mary became pregnant with um, the baby, like Jesus Christ, they say she was she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And I was taught that the Holy Spirit was God, right? That he placed the seed inside of Mary. And last week, I was told that the Holy Spirit was Gabriel, and Gabriel came down in the form of a man, a perfect man. And he approached Mary, and when she became pregnant, with the baby, with Jesus Christ, and that he was the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Well, the thing is, the Bible, Mark uh, 3, 29, talks about people who are going to blaspheme. And it breaks down from 27 to 29. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first buy the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Mm -hmm. This may sound crazy, but you don't understand the middle way I'm saying. 28, verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemy wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. All right? But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost 
has never forgiven us. You understand? Mm -hmm. But is in danger of eternal damnation. Now here's what I say. 35 will say, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus clearly differentiates between who the Holy Spirit is and who his heavenly Father is. Your Father says, Jesus can never send God anywhere. God sends people, yet Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to people. You understand that? So the reality, the point I'm trying to make is that when they say that God and the Holy Spirit are one, they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel, and there are many other Holy Spirits in the scriptures. All the angels who were seraphim were called Holy Spirit. All the angels who were cherubim or cherub were called unclean or unholy spirit. And there are many people, I'm sad to say, in the church that's presently under the symbol of, of Penta, which is a symbol of Satan called the Pentecostal church, are preaching to the world that they're receiving a Holy Spirit when indeed they're receiving an unclean and unholy spirit because their actions are like the people who Jesus had to cast demons out of. Meaning, they start foaming from the mouth, jumping out their teeth, kicking and screaming, and saying they're speaking in some unorderable tongue. These are the people who Jesus said had legions in them because they're acting crazy. No Holy Spirit or righteous spirit is going to grab no old woman out of her seat and pick her up and throw her on the floor and have her kicking and foaming on the, and punching people in the head and mothering gibberish. I bet by the land some preachers stand up and say she called the name of the Lord. No Holy Spirit will do that. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. He is gentle. You see? When he comes upon you, you're full of the Holy Spirit like when Jesus received his baptism in the Jordan under John the Baptist. When the Spirit descended upon Jesus, did they say anything about Jesus jumping about the water, flipping all over the place and acting stupid? No. He was rejoicing because he had received the Holy Spirit. But it does not throw you on the floor and make you foam out the mouth. There are unholy spirits in the world today. And many churches are infested with these unclean, unholy spirits who are making them think they're following the Lord Jesus Christ and they're really following a man called Bar Jesus of Sorcerer who had the power to cast demons into people too. You understand? Yes. Yeah. The church that I was attending is a Pentecostal church and when they say they receive the Holy Spirit, they do just as you said. And when I go, I just sit there and I don't get the urge to just get up and scream and holler and do like they do. That's because you're honest. You know, you know old Miss Maxine gets it every week. You start knowing the people who get it. Old Brother George runs over whole Mrs. Maxine's hand and pats her on the hand. And Sister Gladys comes over with a rag and pats her on her neck and fans us. This is a ritual. This ain't real. You understand? They said in the book of Acts, when the Spirit came down, fire came out of their mouth. Don't be fooled by the devil. The devil is a master of deception. That is his game. And it's sad that the Christian churches now, people who have went to church with an open and a sincere heart, are now being possessed and controlled by demons. And they really think they're propagating righteousness. It's a sad thing. Those people rehearse that. The reason why you haven't got the Holy Spirit is because you didn't rehearse it. You probably say it. You know, if you go to the church, you know better than we do because you watch the people. Now, we got what? Matthew 28, 19. Read it. Wait a minute. Okay, Matthew 28, 18. Make it simple so you start from when Jesus starts to speak. Mm -hmm. Matthew 28, what? 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore and teach your nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. That's one being. And of the Son. That's and him. The Holy Ghost. Those are three separate beings. Now they're going to make them all one. Mm -hmm. Right? Why do they make them one? Because whenever you look at a human being, people ask most, many times, do I believe in the Trinity? Yes, I do. I believe in the Trinity. I don't, the Muslim concept of the Trinity and the Christian concept of the Trinity is totally different. I do believe there is a Heavenly Father. He's one. I do believe that we are his children, his sons. That's true. 
And I do believe in the angelic beings. That's three. I believe in the Holy Spirit, those are angels. I believe in the Son of Man, that's man. I believe in the Heavenly Father, that's two. And I believe the Heavenly Father is in us, and I believe we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, so all three can be working through one man at one time. You understand? So you can be full of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody tell you you can't, but you better make sure it's holy and not an unholy one. Because the unholy spirit really hurts people. Thank you.